Ever since I was young, I never really understood anything about the world. And I never understood anything that happened in my life. The only thing that ever made sense to me was you. And how I felt about you. That's all I've ever known. And that's enough. That's enough for me for the rest of my life, Topanga. Oh, man. This is a big one. You ever look up reviews of a major, well-known show on YouTube, and for some reason, there aren't that many? Yeah, I couldn't believe it either. And I know it's not because no one watched this show. Of all the shows I've reviewed so far, I'm absolutely positive this is the one the most people have seen. Now, at this point, I've been surprised a bunch of times that some of the shows I've reviewed don't get a lot of YouTube love. But this is different because no show I've reviewed up to this point was anywhere near the generational and cultural juggernaut that this show was. Not even close. And because this was a seven season sitcom, this was actually the hardest video I have ever made. This was a show with several different stories in each season and way more standalone episodes themes, and character arcs that zigzag all over the place. That makes it harder to talk about than anything I've reviewed so far, because there's so much to talk about. And there's a lot to say about this show. A lot. And we're going to talk about it all. What I like, and what I don't like. So take your seats. Class is in session. I'm here to talk about one of the funniest and most impactful sitcoms ever. Boy Meets World. Okay, so before we really get into it, first things first. This entire review will contain spoilers. This isn't Moral Oral or Lonesome Dove, and it certainly ain't the life and times of Tim. A metric fuck ton of people have watched Boy Meets World. So if you're here watching this review of this show, you've probably seen the show. I don't think I have to recommend this one. It's one of the most beloved and popular sitcoms of all time, and it earned it. This is gonna be my general thoughts pros and cons, followed by my classic season-by-season -season format and final thoughts. Secondly, Boy Meets World now holds a personal record for me. It is the first sitcom I have ever watched all the way through in its entirety. And when I say sitcom, I don't mean just any comedy series, I mean a traditional sitcom. A show filmed on sets in front of a live audience or with a laugh track. Specifically, that type of sitcom. Don't get me wrong, I watched a few episodes of Boy Meets World as a kid when it aired on the Disney Channel, definitely enough to know the main characters, but I never watched it from beginning to end. And after watching Boy Meets World, I am of the opinion that these types of sitcoms are not meant to be marathon. Before watching this show, sitcoms to me were the kinds of shows where you just catch a couple episodes on TV and have a few laughs. Over several seasons, actors get switched out a lot, continuity changes, certain characters disappear, etc. And when you're watching a show once a week over the course of seven years, with long breaks in between, you probably won't notice that stuff. But when you're marathoning that show over the course of a couple months, you notice all of it. For example, Topanga's dad is played by three different actors over the course of the series, and they all look and act completely differently. It's like they're playing three different characters, it's fucking jarring. But that's the way these types of shows are, you kinda just have to put it out of your mind. I'm gonna focus more on my feelings of the actual content of the show than on its backstory. After all, this video is really my definitive opinions on the show, not the complete history of Boy Meets World, but you gotta talk about it a little bit, so here's the cliff notes. Boy Meets World first aired as part of ABC's TGIF block, a block that also included Full House, Family Matters, Sister Sister, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. It ran its course from beginning to end as part of this block from 1993 to 2000. It was a popular show during its run, but was later syndicated by Disney and aired on the Disney Channel where its fanbase grew exponentially. Boy Meets World was created by Michael Jacobs and April Kelly. Michael Jacobs previously created Dinosaurs. Remember that show? That was on TGIF too. April Kelly is extremely elusive. I seriously can't find any footage of a single interview she's ever given. 
There's an entire backstory involving the history of the pilot of the show. Michael Jacobs wanted to focus the show on Corey, the middle child, rather than Eric, the eldest. The first episode is the one where Eric takes a lady friend to the Phillies game instead of Corey. But whereas most shows would focus on Eric's date and all the wacky shenanigans they'd get into, the focus here is on Corey's reaction to feeling like his brother is abandoning him for some woman. The pilot was also rewritten overnight by Michael Jacobs because William Daniels wasn't satisfied with the way Mr. Feeney was portrayed in the first script. He had this hang up where he didn't want the main teacher of the show to be mocked or for educators to be dissed. Which might sound silly, but look at what we got out of it. One of the greatest educators in the history of fiction. Boy Meets World's origin story seems simple. A little too simple. The creators were contracted to write a show for kids 12 to 14. Teach some life lessons, have a few laughs. Sounds easy enough, right? That's sort of the template for a sitcom. So why do people remember this show? And what do I like most about it? Here's a couple preliminary thoughts on what I think are Boy Meets World's strong suits. First and foremost, Boy Meets World is funny. You know what the best part about being a virgin is? What? No, I'm asking. There are moments where it's hilarious, and I think people forget how great the humor is. This show has gained a sort of reputation for the lessons it teaches, or the sad emotional moments, the character arcs, etc. But Boy Meets World is a sitcom before anything else, and in a sitcom, the humor comes first. And despite all that it's known for, Boy Meets World never dropped the laughs unless the atmosphere absolutely called for it. I love you very much. Yeah? And I got a crush on you. <laughs> This short scene made me laugh so hard I had to pause the show and rewind it like four times. As did this one. On the first day, we start off with <laughs> and then we focus on <laughs> But although funny, Boy Meets World star really rose in the lessons it taught. The lessons in the show are easy to relate to for anyone who's ever been the same age as the main characters. I'm a huge fan of a story having a moral without teaching it in a heavy-handed way. Boy Meets World not only pulls this off, but is probably the show that was best at it. I think that's why so many of the things it teaches have such staying power. And a device it often uses to do this is tragedy. This is where a lot of the meat of Boy Meets World comes in. Because the biggest ways in which we are introduced to the world are usually tragic. Boy Meets World had some truly serious moments for some of its characters, especially for one character in particular, but we'll get there. Another thing that I think gave this show such staying power is that it's a coming-of-age show done almost in real time. We follow the core characters from middle school to college as they age. So the show did something interesting that most shows don't or can't pull off. It aged around them. The plots of the episodes tend to handle the kinds of stuff kids encounter with each new age these characters hit. Speaking of, there are a lot of strong suits this show has, but perhaps its strongest is its characters. Boy Meets World does something absolutely remarkable. It makes you proud of its characters. When you see these characters go through trial and tribulation after trial and tribulation, and make the right choices, or bounce back from a wrong choice, you will be cheering for them. I grew so attached to some of these characters that I was genuinely sad when the show ended. I don't think sitcoms are meant to be marathoned, but I did marathon this one and after spending only about two months with these guys, it hurt to let them go. In a really strange way. Like, it didn't hurt this much when I had to say goodbye to characters from drama shows I've spent time on. Even though this show has a strange, surreal element to it that involves breaking the fourth wall numerous times, that somehow never made these characters feel less real to me. And part of that I realize is because I watched Cory, Sean, and Topanga grow from 11-year-olds all the way to 18-year-olds, but another part of that is because the actors they hired for this show are incredible. Boy Meets World has some of the best acting I have ever seen in a sitcom. These actors all had to show a surprising amount of range over the course of this show. They're believable even when they're acting unbelievable. To the point where there were moments when one of them was about to do something dumb that I KNEW was gonna bite them in the ass, and I would just say, you fucking dumbass, out loud to my TV. 
Like, I was so invested in these fictional characters that I was yelling at them through my TV to cut the shit and do right by themselves. It's hard to make an audience laugh and then in the same breath make them feel gravitas. That's why I really, really have to give it up for these incredibly talented actors. Ben Savage, Ryder Strong, Will Friedle, my favorite, Danielle Fischel, Trina McGee, William Daniels, and the rest really sell their characters and the writers, for the most part, stay true to these characters. Each actor in the show seems to have their own backstory and the parts they played on the show. For example, Ben Savage was already under contract with ABC, even at age 12, because his family were already heavy hitters in the sitcom scene. Ryder Strong was such a good fit that he was the first and only choice ever for Sean. Danielle Fischel was almost fired after her first day on the job, then went home, practiced, redid her entire delivery, and earned the part again. Trina McGee actually had a rough time on the show, both with the other actors and with Michael Jacobs, who was sort of a bully to her. And then of course, there's Will Friedle, who, as the show went on, grew into the increasingly zany and ad-libbed personality of Eric so much that he practically began writing the character himself. He's often credited with having more and more control over what the character did with each passing season. Unfortunately though, we don't have too much time to dwell on the detailed histories of every actor, but I wish we did. I really, really wish we did. Something funny I've noted about Boy Meets World is that most of the actors in the show haven't been in a lot of other big roles, to the point where I think they've become impossible to separate from their characters on the show. Like when you watched Cabin Fever, you were probably like, oh, Sean Hunter's in this. Or my personal favorite, when William Russ was in American History X, in that dinner scene where he says the N-word. And it's the most jarring thing in the world because Corey's dad just said the N-word. I could just picture Amy going, Alan, that's racist. There are some exceptions to this though. Like Ethan Supley has been in so much other stuff that I don't only think of him as Frankie Stacchino. And Maitland Ward, who played Rachel, of course. I'm a huge fan of her work post Boy Meets World. Huge fan. There is something else I like about Boy Meets World that a lot of people do forget when complimenting the show. And that's that the show has this level of surrealism lurking just beneath the surface. There's an early episode where Minkus accidentally discovers time travel, and I thought, well, that's weird, is that canon? But then as the show goes on, there are episodes with all kinds of stuff like that going on. So, I guess it's all canon. There's a supernatural element to Boy Meets World. There's even a wild episode where Eric gets casted on a show where all the actors are the main cast, and he doesn't seem to question it at all. Or even notice it. Then, at the end of the episode, he actually flips out and stops being Eric Matthews. He just becomes Will Friedle, and Ben Savage and Ryder Strong are like, cut, what just happened? It's crazy. And miracle of miracles, none of this stuff throws off the serious moments of the show. I think that's why I like it. It's weird at first, then as the show goes on, you see them embrace the silliness more and more, but it never interfered with my ability to take the characters or story seriously. I give a lot of credit to a show that can pull something like that off. Also, unlike many shows of its type that last seven seasons, Boy Meets World never jumps the shark. Not even once. I definitely experienced some lag while marathoning it, but like I said, that's because I don't think sitcoms are meant to be marathoned. It's not because the quality of the show decreased, and believe me, I can spot the difference. That's why they put me in the big chair. Now, there are a few bones I do have to pick with Boy Meets World, and I'll go over these a little bit more in depth once we go season by season. But my biggest one is the extent to which they write characters out of the show or replace the actors. This show is so good at getting us invested in its characters that it even gets us invested in the minor ones. So it hurts when they disappear. Minkus was a main member of the cast in season one. Then he disappeared except for a punchline in season five. Harley Kiner was an enormous part of season two, only to have his character replaced in one episode, then the original actor brought back briefly in season three. Frankie was around for a while, but disappeared in the last two seasons. Mr. Turner, who was, again, a main member of the cast for two seasons, kind of tapered off in season four, and we last see him lying in a fucking hospital bed with Sean crying next to him. Yo, they really did Mr. Turner dirty. And don't even get me started on Topanga's dad, again. And I understand this is a sitcom issue across the board. Actors sign contracts and get other jobs, they move on to different projects, etc. Obviously, I can't expect Ethan Supley to return to Boy Meets World consistently, his film career was taking off at that point. Alright kids, 
This wouldn't be the plebe's official definitive review if I didn't go season by season. Buckle yourselves in, because in case you didn't see the timestamp, this ain't a short one. The first season of Boy Meets World pretty much throws you right into the formula. The script is already superb, each episode jam-packed with fun and important dialogue. It's funny that they were really trying to work with the idea of a third person to hang with Corey and Sean. There's a couple actors you'll see hanging with them or sitting at their lunch table for a few episodes, then you'll never see them again. There was actually this one chair at the lunch table that the cast called the death chair because every actor who sat in that chair ended up not staying after the first season. And some of those lines ended up being rewritten for Sean. Remember when he calls his sister for hair advice? Never hear from her again. The first season is also a little strange because Topanga is not a main character yet. Like, her name isn't even in the main title sequence. Which, by the way, the title sequence in this show changes every season, and season one has the longest one by far. But you know who is in nearly every episode of season one and whose name is in the title sequence? Minkus. Minkus was a main character in the first season of Boy Meets World, and he's a good character. They use him in fun ways over the course of the season, and there are even episodes centered around him. And he feels like part of the group. Yeah, Corey and Sean make fun of him a lot, but they also hang out with him outside of school, and he's friends with Topanga and kind of in love with her. He felt like he belonged on the show. And after this season, he just disappears forever. Except that one time they bring him back at the end of season 5 as a punchline, but come on. Wouldn't it have been cool to see Minkus in high school? There isn't really a nerd character in the high school seasons. They could have explored what high school was like for nerdy kids through Minkus. That would have fit right in with the show's messages and such. Plus, he was into Topanga during a time when Corey still looked at her as a weirdo. He could have been part of the love triangles in the middle seasons. Just look at him work in that game. In case you're one of those people who doesn't think that every part of every episode of a show is canonical, they make Minkus disappear in the season finale, and he does for a while. This is probably the season we see Morgan the most in. Not that she does much. I do love that Morgan is the straight man to Eric's foil sometimes, and that she's sort of manipulative for being a toddler. Also, I kind of thought the math problem, not having an answer, was kind of dumb. Because it does. It's a math problem. You don't assume there are other variables in a math problem unless the question specifically states that there are. For anyone interested, it would take them three and a half minutes to wash the car. There are moments in the show that do hit you with some gravitas, even this early. The boxing gloves episode really got me. As did the racism episode, which tackled, well, fucking racism. And the Holocaust. They actually said a slur in an ABC sitcom to teach us something, which is pretty fucking ballsy. I like the one episode where they're watching Leave It to Beaver, and the episode is by proxy about how there's no such thing as a normal family. It's like the show knew how good it was even in the first season. Like the writers were saying, watch us put Leave It to Beaver to shame. The season also ends on a very cool note. Corey thanks Mr. Feeney for teaching him something and then says, For what? I don't know yet. But you will, Corey. You will. Other notes. Uh, whoever does the voice on the TV is amazing. This goes for the entire show. If you're not making a lot of money, you a loser! <laughs> Also, whatever happened to this walking Jewish stereotype? This guy kept cracking me up every time he was on screen. He never showed up after this season, except as a different character. Did you know call waiting is only pennies a day? Well, you got a warping son. I'm not spending enough time with my dad. You step out of this house, I'm on my way to my first ballet lesson. You're gonna be one of those girls who doesn't shave her legs, aren't you? <laughs> How come when I make paper airplanes, I get detention and he doesn't? Can anyone tell me what the acronym SCUBA is? Mr. Matthews. Duba? <laughs> SCUBA Duba. Season 2 is absolutely one of the greatest seasons of Boy Meets World. Yeah, it sucks that we have to say goodbye to Minkus, but now we have some of the best supporting characters in the show making their intros. We have Mr. Turner, Harley, Frankie and Joey, and Griff in the later episodes. 
Mr. Turner, as we know, is the second most beloved teacher in the show. His teaching style versus Feeney's is the core of a lot of episodes and leads to some great moments in this season. They have an excellent rapport that I could have watched the entire rest of the series. Then there's Harley, Frankie, and Joey, my favorite supporting characters maybe in the entire show. These three are fucking hilarious. They steal the show in every scene they're in. Remember when Harley has tea with Amy? I love this guy. I was so into these characters that in that one random episode where they replace Harley's actor, I was pissed. And the replacement is nowhere near as good. There was actually a reason for this. Danny McNulty, who played Harley, had a nervous breakdown towards the end of season two. That explains the completely jarring replacement and why they later wrote him out and replaced him with Griff, played by Adam Scott. But they did make it up to us by bringing him back for a send-off in Season 3. Also, I loved Griff too. I liked that he was a legitimately different character from Harley, not just a replacement with the same exact personality and mannerisms. Come to think of it, Season 2 might be the funniest season of the show overall. Corey and Sean are really, like, over-the-top dumb in the season. Remember when Corey thought he was turning into a werewolf? And the band episode where they just lie their way into performing at a concert? Like, how far can you possibly take a lie? Or when they see Mr. Turner's lesson plan and use it to pass the quiz, which they find out later is just called studying. Also, the Danger Boy episode is classic. But the real main event of season two to me, and one of my absolute favorite episodes of the show, is the Thrilla in Phila. This episode was insane. They went as far as they could go, and it was awesome. It's revealed that Frankie's dad is Vader, the professional wrestler, and he stays a recurring character for several seasons. I don't know if this is the greatest episode of the show overall, but it's definitely my favorite of the first two seasons. And even after all the shenanigans, it has one of the show's greatest lines. I do my thing and you do your thing. You are you and I am I. And if in the end we end up together, it's beautiful. Also, this whole season, Corey keeps saying, I haven't made a name for myself. Yes, you have. You started a protest against an assignment. You trolled the entire school into thinking you had a band. You ran for class president. You started a radio show. If this were a real high school, everyone would know who you are. This is also the season where there's a little more going on between Corey and Topanga. Topanga is a bigger character now, and there's definitely some will-they-won't-they they going on here. Just enough for 7th grade. Oh, and since when is 7th grade high school? When I was in 7th grade, it was definitely still middle school. And I didn't know any kid in 7th grade that dated as many girls as Sean. Like, Jesus Christ, this kid is a 7th grade pimp. He's a fucking womanizer, and he's, like, 13. And Corey, when he does attract women, attracts the craziest ones. Like, he just has that face that attracts nut jobs. This is also the season where we really learn about Sean's home life. In Wrong Side of the Tracks, his family is revealed first for laughs, and then in a serious light. We start seeing a lot more to him than just the cherry bomb in the mailbox or his dad getting laid off. This culminates in him moving in with Mr. Turner, which was a really great way to end the arc they built for him in this season. I also started really noticing actors who were still getting their starts in this show, like Mina Savari or the Doctor from Sons of Anarchy. You're gonna see this a lot as the show goes on. You saying I'm gay? Hey, look, it's a kid from when you was gay. <laughs> hey, you know, my Uncle Ralph was in a documentary. They put a big blue dot over his face and changed his voice. <laughs> studying <laughs> so am I the third season of boy meets world is a milestone for each of the main characters especially in the relationship between Corey and Topanga mainly because this is the season where they are finally in a relationship there's so much will they won't they in this season and it all culminates in that moment at Disney World that we all remember speaking of Topanga she starts really developing character traits that become the ones she has for the rest of the series Namely, she becomes a nagging know-it-all in this season. Like when Sean adopts the pig and she won't stop giving him shit for it. But to her credit, she usually does acknowledge when she's wrong. I think a huge plus in her relationship with Corey is that they are each able to recognize when they do wrong. There are also moments of true relationship realism when it comes to Corey and Topanga. Like that time they break up out of boredom. That's 
what happens in high school relationships. Ain't no couples counseling in high school. Corey also begins developing character traits that become the ones he has for the rest of the series. Namely, he's a neurotic maniac who just can't let things go. Case in point, when he just doesn't stop filming Sean's family in the trailer park. That was pretty fucked up. But it led to Sean and Corey's first fight in one of the show's greatest lines. You don't have to be blood to be family. Now let's talk about Sean. Sean is living with Mr. Turner this season, but he misses his dad and in the end moves back to the trailer park. There are still a lot of dark times ahead for this kid, but just having his dad back and appreciating what Mr. Turner did for him is truly a good, solid moment for him. I love that Sean's reputation as a playboy actually comes back to haunt him when he attempts something real with Dana. I would also like to say that I really wish they had done a little more with Dana. You know, Sean's first girlfriend, who everyone forgets about. He really earned her. This was a huge moment for him, and she wasn't just one of his one-and-done girls. She comes back in another episode and is mentioned in the rest of the season. Then she disappears, and when she returns, she's Sean's enemy. I would have liked a little more than just they broke up between seasons. Finally, Eric's relationship with Corey, often overlooked, comes back to haunt him. Eric's seemingly impossible accomplishment this season was graduating high school. But he doesn't get into college and has a moment where, despite how unhinged and dumb he is, he actually has a moment of real self-reflection. I didn't get in. What? They rejected me. Uh, maybe it was a mistake. It was my mistake. It was my mistake thinking I could slack off for three and a half years, work hard for two months and get in. Ugh. But he's had his own adventures separate from Corey's for the past two seasons, and their relationship has been neglected. So in the end, what happens? He just says fuck it and goes on a road trip with his brother. Couldn't ask for a better ending to a season. Oh, Morgan disappears for the first half of season three because they had to change the actress who played her. We did get a pretty good joke out of it, though. Apparently, she was in time out for, like, a year. But Jason, Eric's best friend for the entire first two seasons, he's gone. No explanation. Bye bye But there is one Season 2 character they did right by in Season 3. I absolutely, positively love that they had that one episode where they brought Harley back and it was the original actor who played him. And he meets Griff. This episode ruled because it was sort of a goodbye to these two characters that I loved from Season 2. But the good news is Frankie and Joey stick around for a while. Speaking of Frankie, that episode where he has a story arc is incredible. There is one character who gets unexpected character development, and it's actually pretty amazing. And that's Mr. Feeney. We actually learn from his diary that he had a wife, and it's inferred that she died. I'm sure some of us remember a moment where we realized that one of our teachers was... human. This one was pretty hard-hitting. This is also the first time where we see Mr. Feeney actually defeated, and it's heartbreaking. In the episode Life Lessons, it's almost like this was a moment where he met the world. A very ugly part of it. But even he bounces back from it, choosing to not give up on teaching. Rave On is definitely a highlight of this season. When Eric plans a rave at Chubby's and his parents think it's an anniversary party for them, hilarity ensues. Speaking of hilarity, Sean and Eric are both shown being idiot savants, and the whole thing with Eric's sleep test is great. Something else pretty big happens in this season. Corey, Sean, and Eric's grades all come up at different points. Eric even gets an A. Holy shit. Chet also returns and Sean decides to move back in with his dad. And I get it. Mr. Turner is a good man, but he and Sean both mutually agree that he's not Sean's dad. And that's okay. It's something they talk out after the ups and downs of living together. They still maintain a bond, and that's important. Also, why are all the people in that diner that Chet works at talking like they're from the South? I mean, Chet's clearly from the South. But not every person sitting in a diner in the Philly metro would sound like that. Oh, this is the season where we get the third teacher of the show, Mr. Williams who is only ever in this season, but is a big part of it. 
After this season, he joined the other supporting characters in a missing persons file, never to be seen again. I feel like I should mention the 50s time travel episode. It fully embraced the surreal and sort of sets the standard for the truly surreal and bizarre episodes in the future. Oh, and they ran with this whole time travel thing multiple times. No, really, they did it like twice more after this. Oh, also, um, hi, Brittany Murphy. And Mina Savari again. The kid from the Sandlot. I keep noticing this stuff. I love that the film Paint Your Wagon was mentioned as a joke in an episode. Because A, that's a real movie. And B, it had a much more famous joke reference in The Simpsons. And although that one was funnier, I'd like to point out that this Boy Meets World episode came out first. I really started noticing how often they recycle sets in this season. Like, did you notice that the bathroom is also sometimes Mr. Feeney's office? Again, this is something I probably wouldn't notice if I hadn't marathoned the show. And now for this season's funniest moments. So, here we are at the doorstep. Boring, you said that three times already. I just can't get over it. I mean, a door, a step, it's a doorstep. It's just the perfect word. Yeah, well, according to my new book, Farm Animals Make Great Pets, Farm Animals Make Great Pets. <laughs> Look, last night at Chubby, Shalma's out with this pig. Hey, hey. Hey, I brought you up better than to talk like that. A real pig. Why, what's in the bag? You. It's like looking into a mirror, huh? <laughs> Eric, you'd have to be the biggest idiot on the planet to actually think that's me. Hey, Eric, hey, Cor. <laughs> I love you very much. Yeah, and I got a crush on you. <laughs> All right, Boy Meets World Season 4. Wait a second, plebe! Uh, Joe, I'm kind of in the middle of something. Plebe, look at the timestamp on your video, for Christ's sake. It's long as fuck! You've been going on and on for like half an hour! Yeah, so what? I've made videos longer than half an hour before. But you're not even halfway through your script! You got like 45 minutes left! Well, uh, what should I do? Maybe you should divide this one into two parts. Yeah, you know what? I am gonna do that. Folks, thanks so much for watching part one of my complete review of Boy Meets World. Stay tuned for part two, it'll be coming out soon. Please, if you like this video, press like. If you love this video, press subscribe. If you want to make me a very happy plebe, please consider donating a measly dollar to my Patreon, and stay tuned.